Welcome to another exciting episode of London Lights. Today, I'm just tickled to have as my guest, Ron Sexsmith. He's a legendary Canadian musical treasure, and he joins us here on the program. We're straying a little bit from our typical London-focused agenda, but for Ron Sexsmith, I'm going to do it. All so right. here we are. Ron, welcome to the program. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for having me. But let me just read a little bit about you, just a highlight bio. Ron Eldon Sexsmith, born January 8th, 1964, is a Canadian singer-songwriter from St. Catharines, Ontario. He was the Songwriter of the Year at the 2005 Juno Awards. He began releasing recordings of his own material in 1985 at age 21 and has since recorded 17 albums. He was the subject of a 2010 documentary called Love Shines. Now, I, I was interested when I read your uh, bio, I read about you at 17 playing a bar in St. Catharines, the Lions Tavern. Yeah. And, and you had a reputation there as the one-man jukebox. Yeah. That's hard to do. I play guitar, too. But to just take requests from the audience and nail them, uh, that's some special talent. Tell me about it. Well, I didn't know if I was nailing them. But, um, you know, I mean, the, th the thing is, I, I really didn't know what I was going to do with my life. So when I got out of high school in 81, my older brother um, got me an audition at the Lions Tavern because he was playing there himself in a cover band. And he said, if you're going to play here, you're going to have to learn other people's songs. You know, you're going to have to learn Neil Young and all this stuff. So he lent me all these records and I took records out from the library and just, you know, played all the stuff that you would expect, right? CCR yeah. and the Beatles. And, but, um, and I was so young, I wasn't even old enough to be in a bar. So I had to get permission from the government, you know. But the thing is, I think because I was so young, I sort of really caught on and where in a matter of weeks, I was just packing them in every weekend. And, you know, everyone would come to me with their requests. Can you play this and this and this? So I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go home and I'll learn it for next week. And I, and I would do, you know, learn it as best as I could and I would play it. And uh, people appreciated that. And I remember your know, journalist came down uh, from the local newspaper and that was his headline, the one, one man jukebox. I never really felt it was that accurate, but I mean, I was just playing songs and, and just trying to, I was really eager to please. I was young and I had this, uh, playing a noisy, rowdy bar, um, smoky, you know, and everything. It was a real, you know, eye-opening experience for me. And it was, I think, ultimately important for me just to, to do it, you know, to get on stage because it, it was kind of scary, you know, sometimes. Yeah, um, sure. But uh, so I did that on and off for about six years. I was kind of the, you know, I think towards the end, I, I kind of wore out my welcome there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, well, yeah. you know, I lived in Niagara region for a year and uh, uh, that was probably a tough crowd in St. Catharines. Yeah, you're dealing with a lot of union workers and guys coming in after a long day and on the job. Uh, there were a lot, of, yeah, a lot of fights and all sorts of things, you know. And uh, I'd never seen that. I mean, I had seen some of that, but it was just, uh, and to, to figure out, you know, when you're losing the crowd, okay, I better do this song now because the crowd's talking or, you know, all the stuff I kind of had, had to learn, I learned there. So That's cool. Hey, before I forget, I do want to explore your London, Ontario connections. Yeah. Give me something. You got any London, Ontario yeah. connection oh, we do. can exploit here? Well, you know, we were pretty, you know, broke when we were <laughs> kids. And uh, we had a, uh, relatives in London, Ontario, my Uncle Roy and Aunt Donna, who seemed rich to us. You know, they had a swimming pool, and he worked in uh, as a court reporter. I mean, I'm sure they weren't rich, but they, you know, they had a big house. And so we would come up every summer for, it was like our vacation. We, you know, instead of going to Mexico or something, we'd, we'd go there for a week and swim. And and my parents and, and you know, they would all drink and all that kind of stuff. And and but but it was sort of an annual thing we'd come up and um you know and then even when years later when i started to play concerts and tour whenever i played london you know they would come to see me and their my cousins would come out so it 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 is you know that was kind of the extent of it really um although i've obviously i've played london many many times over the years but i always loved um you know, St. Catharines, you know, it was a great place to grow up. And whenever we'd come to London, it just seemed so much bigger than St. Catharines. You know, it was kind of a bit, I was always kind of awestruck, you know. And um, 
I, I don't you know I don't know what the population is, but I, I, it feels like it feels kind of like a big city to me. You know? Yeah. Well, Ron, what was your uh, response from London audiences when you perform here? Oh, London has always been a great place. Like I used to play. There used to be the, the uh, kind of a punk club in the '90s. Um, I don't think it's there anymore. It started with an E, I think. And but every band played there, and and it's funny because and they'd have these really seedy hotel, like kind of a ho hotel room upstairs where, you, where that would be your dressing room, yeah. and you almost didn't want to sit down on anything, you know, because <laughs> um, I think it was, might have been called the Empire. They have some emb anyway embassy, maybe the embassy. embassy. And then so, and then often the shows would start really late. Like sometimes you wouldn't even be on till 11. And I never looked forward to it. But every time, once we got down on stage, it was always, the audience was so up for it. And at the end of the, of the night, we'd be like, oh, that was a great, great show, great crowd. Oh, well, that's cool. And, and that's well, been sort of my experience. You know, now, now I play, you know, the, what's that place? Um, it's like Aeolian a Hall? Yeah, Aeolian Hall, or I'll play the Grand Theater. I love the Grand Theater, by the way. But yeah, it's always been a good audience. Yeah, well, we love to have you, Ron. Yeah. And uh, if it's any consolation, Ronnie Hawkins and the band stayed at the embassy <laughs> their shows as well, way back yeah, I mean, then. That was a staple. If you were touring London, you would play the embassy. And so many nights we'd be touring in the winter, and I just remember freezing in the dressing room stairs and then like load, loading yeah. our stuff in a snowstorm into the venue or something. So. Right. Well, you know, I used to watch uh, shows on MTV called Driven. Yeah. And uh, it was about artists that had a really hard time getting started, they had a bumpy road to success, but they had this sense of destiny about them. And I, I've done a little bit of research on you, and I get the sense that you were maybe in that same type of vein. Um, it wasn't handed to you on a silver platter, your success. Tell me how it all happened. No, it wasn't. You know, I mean, as a kid, um, I loved music. It was the only thing that I was interested in really you know my brothers were into sports and but music was just everything and i loved to sing but i didn't know if i was a good singer or not but i so i would have this dream you know i remember being a uh, i was a member of the elton john fan club when i was nine or ten mm -hmm. and just dreaming about oh wouldn't that be great to make records and tour and all that stuff but i didn't know how to get there and it wasn't really until my son was born when i was 21 that i started writing songs and then, and then at that point, it's like, well, how do I do it? I had, I got to move to the big city, and um, and and I got turned down by everyone in the Canadian music industry like about three times. I wasn't packing them in, but I never gave up because I kept thinking, well, I'm born on the same day as Elvis Presley, so that's <laughs> that's got to mean something. So I kept I kept at it, and finally, I have, you know, uh, a song of mine made it down to Los Angeles where a publisher down there heard it and they came up to see me. Um, but it, it was sort of funny because like I say, I'd been rejected by the whole Canadian music industry. And when I finally got signed by Interscope Records who were like the biggest label at that particular time, um, they, they didn't see it coming. They were like, well, how did this happen? This is, you know. <laughs> so there was a lot of backpedaling going on, right? <laughs> okay, we always knew you, were, you could make it, but you know. And so I've always felt slightly a bit of resentment actually towards me from the industry because I sort of came in the back door or something. Yeah. But, but I just, you know, and I was already 30 when I got signed, which is kind of old for music, the music industry. But I just kept thinking, well, Bill Withers didn't make his first album until he was 32, I think, or 33, you know? So, uh, and I just had a lot of time to make up for, and I just, I just got right to work, you know? But it took me a long time, and now, you know, I'm going to be 60 in two years. So it's just, uh, I'm just so relieved that it happened, right? Well, you know, your fans, Ron, I mean, they're almost cultish. You they are. Ron Sexsmith, and if it's a fan, yeah. you're like, oh, Ron, you know, they just love what you do. And then I'm one of those people as well. But um, I heard, I had M. Griner on our show uh, just last season. Yeah. And she, your name came up. And she said, you know, Ron's a, uh, a musical treasure in Canada, but he's a star in Europe. <laughs> and uh, well, and I, I, as I researched it, I see that that's true. What can you tell me about that? How did you become so big in Europe? How'd that get started? Well, my, my first album came out in North America only in 1995. And it, uh, it, and it just died. And it came out 
nobody bought it, nobody, the radio wouldn't play it. And what happened was in December of 1995, they have a magazine over in the UK called Mojo Magazine. It's a music for music nerds like me, you know. And mm -hmm. on the cover, on the cover was Elvis Costello holding up my album, saying it was his favorite album of that whole year. And it was kind of like the shot heard around the world in a way. And and all this and the label was about to drop me because they didn't like my record and hadn't done well. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, we have to get this album released overseas. So 90, 1996, I spent much of that year touring the same album, but over, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, and, you know, all over the UK and Ireland. And that's where I found my audience. And I remember the first time I was touring, I was touring Canada, everybody thought I was from England or something, because, you know, I, even though I'd been out a year or whatever. Um, so it, it really took me till about... Uh, maybe my third, fourth album where I started to get some traction in Canada and start the, and I started to feel like I was part of, because everywhere in Europe, they all knew I was from Canada. You know, I, I was, they were well aware and they would always ask me, what is it about Canada that you would produce Neil, you know, Neil Young, Leonard Cohen, Gordon Lightfoot, you know, and Joni. And I was, those were the people that I was trying to, um, I was trying to follow in their footsteps. But it, it took a while for me to establish myself here. Uh, but that's true of a lot of people. Same with Feist, you know, she had to make it in France first before she was big here. So, uh, and then there's some bands who are huge in Canada and nobody knows them anywhere else. So yeah, it's right. like, a, you know, it's either or kind of thing. Yeah, right. Well, Ron, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by your story, but we have to take a break. Okay. That we'll be back in a couple minutes to have further discussion with you. So just hang on, don't go away. And viewers, we'll be right back with Ron Sexton. All right, we're here on London Lights and we're back with Ron Sexsmith. Ron, you're an easy guy to talk to. I'm enjoying the interview and uh, I wish we had more time. We've, uh, we're already halfway done. But let me start by saying this. Uh, when I drive back from my cottage, I'm usually bummed out, got to leave the cottage, go back to work, go back to London. Mm -hmm. But I've got a CD that lifts my spirits. And it's got all my favorite songs on it. One of them is your song, Strawberry Blonde. Okay. Uh, there's something about that song. I just think it's magical. You're right on the money. The band is hot. It's a beautiful song, beautiful lyrics. Uh, it's on this album. Let me just plug one of your albums here. Other songs. Uh, the lyrics are so gorgeous. I want to read them, but I, I, we don't have time. I want to keep moving. So I'm going to let it go. I'm just going to encourage our viewers, get a hold of that song on iTunes or buy the album or whatever you have to do. It's just a gorgeous song. And Ron, the melodies come out of you so sweetly. Uh, I, I love your guitar work. But it's almost like your voice is a separate ins instrument and it floats above the music or mm. above the instruments, I should say. Uh, mm. You have a magic way with melody. And uh, what do you attribute that to? For me, uh, all my heroes were very uh, strong melodically, you know. And I grew up in the mid 60s and 70s, which was a very melodic period for music. Um, you know, you'd have, the, you know, not only the Beatles, but obviously. Bad Finger and Burt Bacharach and Harry Nilsson and uh, so I had just it was a, it felt magical to me growing up. You turn on the radio and every song I heard I, and the and the things they were singing about as a kid was I felt very thought provoking. It wasn't always you know I, I want, you know let me see your body or whatever one sings about these days. They you know they would sing about stuff and and I and, and I was really into music so so I. So it just, it definitely got into my DNA, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and since I started making records, a lot of those people, a lot of my heroes have been very nice to me and have said nice things. And because I think they can see that I really honor what they did. And, and I've tried to continue that, you know, because I really love melodic songs. And it's just, that's the easy part. The lyrics are always the hard part for me, but I know, I know I can do it. Um, you know, if I take my time and, I, and I'm patient, like Strawberry Blonde, you mentioned, that took me almost two years to write. Wow. Um, because of the lyrics, because um, I, uh, 
originally, you know, I wanted to write it in two verses. I wanted it to be a, almost like um, an impressionistic song, you know, um, but I wasn't able to do that. So in, in the end, it became more of this linear, almost like a Charles Dickens story, yeah. you know, that, that resolved. And, and so it took me a long time. And, um, but I, and it's based on about maybe three or four different people throughout my life, you know. I tried to make a composite of this little character. And it's become, you know, one of my most requested songs. So. Yeah, uh, it's one of uh, absolutely one of my favorites. You follow Leon Russell on the CD, and uh, oh, I love it. Again, driving back from the cottage, you know, once I was checking all the radio channels, it's like the Bruce Springsteen song, fifty-seven channels and nothing on. Yeah, and then I come across Ron Sexsmith in an interview with CBC, and they play a song off uh, one of your newer albums. I'll show you a picture of it here. Last Rider, yeah, and uh, the song Radio came on. Yeah, it's just like oh, this wave of color fills up my car. It's just a beautiful song, uh, very melodic. If I could compare it to something for for viewers that haven't heard it, it's like when you're a kid and you open this bottle of Seven Up and all this effervescence comes out and the bubbles and the <laughs> lime smell and this, the refreshingness of it. That's a very uh, nice just place. a lovely uh, little tune. Mm. Uh, where do you get your inspiration for songs like that? Well, it's funny because that song, lyrically, you know, it's kind of a grumpy song, really. You know, I was singing about how, as a kid, radio was my best friend. You know, you'd be playing road hockey and then someone would have a transistor radio on the curb, right? I mean, there was always music playing in the car, in the house. And then I just was sort of, uh, but since I started making records, I've never felt that radio was my friend, you know. Like, I never, never had a lot of airplay. I mean, the CBC sometimes would play me. In the UK, I had a couple top 10 hits, but so uh, it was just sort of a, a song about feeling a little di uh, disillusioned, really, by the music that, that radio does play sometimes. And I'm, old, I'm an older guy, so, so it was sort of being, talking about a time of radio that really meant a lot to me. And I'm sort of, it was sort of it was kind of like a singing about the old days and bemoaning the current <laughs> period work but but also it's in a it's a very fun song so yeah it's, it's kind of a fun song with a grumpy lyric really <laughs> <laughs> well i sure enjoy it Thanks. um now i want to ask you about your decision to move to stratford yeah. i don't know if you saw the news today uh but we just heard that john till passed away oh i did not hear that oh that's terrible yeah, it is. And uh, and I'd been talking to him about coming on my program last year, but uh, he's uh, he was a little reluctant and he wasn't in the best of health. So he was concerned about uh, how he might look on camera. But unfortunately, he's passed away. But he's one of many great musicians mm. that have uh, been related to the Stratford area. Well, Richard, uh, Ma Richard Manuel, right? Richard Manuel, John Till, uh, Bieber, yourself. What is it about Stratford? Why did you not for instance, locate to LA or stay in Toronto or something like that. What, what's about Stratford that's so appealing? We lived in, you know, I mean, I lived in Toronto for 30 years and I never thought I would leave Toronto because, you know, my kids grew up there and everything. But um, Toronto is not the same city it was when I lived there. You know, it's, it's got, it just got really, very expensive and, and, you know, every space is filled in with the building, it seems. And, and the other thing is we couldn't afford uh, a house there. We were just renting. So, so we, my wife and I had been talking about it for years, like getting out of Toronto, and we just didn't know where to go. But she, she used to work here for someone. And so she, she would come here a lot and really got a good vibe here. And I started coming with her sometimes to check it out. And... Um, but, you know, I, I don't know why there's so the, the, the musical connection. Um, you know, there is a Richard Manuel memorial bench here that sometimes I'll, when I, I'll grab a coffee and I'll just sit on it and I'll sort of almost communicate with him, you know, beyond the grave. Um, but I'm really glad to have ended up here because it's just been a really good thing for my mental state. And, you know, Toronto was getting to be a real stressful place and... Um, but LA, I could never live in LA because I don't drive, you know, and, um, but I, I, I spent a lot of time there making records and, um, so I never felt like I wanted to live there, but, um, I think I've found my place in Stratford and my community. Um, 
and and we have a you know I'm really proud to actually own a house for the first time in my life. So that it's uh, it's been a good good situation. Oh, that's cool. Um, I saw one of your videos on YouTube. It was a song, a cover song of Bob Dylan. Yeah, and uh, it was called "If Not for You," a song right. that uh, that Bob did, and a song that uh, George Harrison did. Uh, I prefer your version over both <laughs> those guys. I hope they uh -oh. never see this, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I think you did that maybe during COVID, and you said you were walking around the house, you just kept playing that song over and over, and your wife said, "Hey, you should record that because that sounds pretty good." Yeah, I remember. We, we were asked actually to film it for something. It might've been for some, yeah, it might've been for a COVID thing. I think other people were making videos as well. I can't remember why, um, but I, you know, I, I'm a, like you say, the one man jukebox. So I could play, you know, you, at the drop of a hat, if someone said, you gotta go play a whole night of Bob Dylan songs, I could get up there and do 20 songs or so just from memory. But If Not For You is from my favorite Dylan album, which is called New Morning. And I love that record. And, um, you know, Olivia Newton-John recorded that song as well, mm. which is where the first time I heard it was from her version. So well, I think I'm lovely... sort of trying to do her version, basically. So, yeah. <laughs> well, it is a lovely little song. But again, it's uh, the special quality of your voice and the inflections and how you work your way around those lyrics. It really makes it, in my view, a masterpiece. Hmm. Was Bob Dylan the greatest songwriter of all time? Oh, man. I... I would probably say so. I mean, he definitely, he definitely takes the cake, right? You know, the people that he's influenced and, I mean, I have other songwriters that I uh, probably influenced me more and that I listen to more like Ray Davies from the Kinks or uh, big, I'm a big Warren Zevon fan, for example. And Bob Dylan actually was a big Warren Zevon fan. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I, I put Bob up there, you know, Bob, he's up there with Lennon and McCartney and, all those guys and, and the greats. Um, I think, yeah, I, it's just when you think about just the whole kind of revolution he started in a way, you yeah. know, with just to get people to, you know, out of the baby, baby, I love you into actually yeah. saying something. And I like yeah. the baby, I love you songs too, but you know, uh, to, to hear a song like Like a Rolling Stone on the radio, <laughs> The guy actually, it's seven minute song and he's actually saying stuff, you know, right. that, that, and, and, and the, just his whole approach, which was not pretty, right? He wasn't trying to sound like Johnny Mathis or anything, you know, so it was very uh, revolutionary. And yeah, so I think he'll always be very highly regarded. So just briefly, Ron, is the art of songwriting a dying art? It isn't in my house, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's for sure. I, I work, I really work at it. And I know there's other people, I mean, I'm a very, I'm a songwriting like purist in a way, you know, I like, I want the lyrics to make sense. I want the song to have structure. I like to have an outro sometimes or an intro and bridges, you know, I pull my hair out of, out of this stuff. And sometimes you feel like, oh, what, what's the point? You know, nobody really cares, you know? Oh, but all the work yeah. you put into it but um and I, and I know that the music that they make now that's a whole other kind of art form and involves writing in the studio with grooves and this and that i don't know how to do that but i know how to write a lyric and a melody and um and that's what i focus on so i, I wouldn't say it's a dying art but but um sometimes i feel like i'm making antique tables you know in, in, in a way um and that's okay yeah. too well, again, I think it's an awesome thing that your talent uh, for songwriting and performing has been recognized worldwide. Uh, and you even had breakfast with Paul McCartney and you get a Christmas card every year from yeah. Elton John. How did all this happen? Like I say, when I first came out in the UK, you know, in 96, almost immediately I was getting all this support from what I like to call the old guard. You know, Elvis Costello, McCartney said nice things. And, you know, Elton John, I, you know, I emailed him the other day, actually, uh, and he was playing Toronto, and I was like, I hope you have a good show tonight, and well, before I went to bed, there was an email back from him <laughs> saying, oh, thanks, we had a really good time. So it's just surreal for me, you know. Um, I, I only met McCartney the one time, but it, it was uh, uh, incredible to have breakfast with him, and we got to sing some songs together. Um, I'll never forget that. Uh, wow. So I just think, again, that they hear what I'm doing, and they see that I have respect for what they did. And 
And I, I just think that's what it is, really. So. Well, well, you struggled and you uh, grinded your way to the top. Uh -huh. And uh, we are so glad, Ron, that you persisted and uh, you're performing such wonderful uh, music. Uh, it's enriching all of our lives. And we thank you for doing that. But any uh, final words? We only have a minute left for young and uh, songwriters, musicians that are maybe just feel like they're beating their head against the wall. What can you say to them? Um, I just think, you know, if if you love it, you know, I mean, I, I've always felt it's important to know the history, you know, to go back and hear the, what the old songwriters did. And even if it, you're not doing that kind of music, you know, it's just good to know wh where it all comes from, I think. And uh, and you can't give up, too, because if I had, I haven't felt like giving up so many times. And like I said, I didn't get signed until I was 30. So there's this feeling yet that it's meant to be or something. If you have that feeling, then you just got to, you know, you got to, you have to work for it. You know, you really have to put the time in and, uh, you know, and then, you know, hopefully the doors will start to open. But yeah, hopefully but the stars align. The like stars align, yeah. So you're heading out on tour. Have yeah. a wonderful tour. You're doing Canada, Eastern Canada, and then Europe. Um, well, I have a new album coming out next year, and I think we're going to start in Europe, I, I think. And then hopefully we have, you know, get, we'll get back to the USA. I haven't played there in a long time. But, uh, but yeah, East, so it'll be Eastern Canada, then next year, hopefully Europe and other places. So. Ron, you've been a delightful interview. I've so much enjoyed talking to you. My mother-in-law is going to put me in the good books <laughs> once again. All right. <laughs> she loves um, you. I love you. Thank Keep you. Keep up the great music, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Take care, man.